Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. Welcome to the Kaiser Report. Mt. Gox is down. That means the Bitcoin bubble is over. Sell everything! Cyprus is going to sell their gold? No, they're not. Yes, they are. No, they're not. Yes, they are. No, they're not. Yes, they are. Oops, the Fed just released their minutes a day early to a few Wall Street banks. Sell everything. No, wait, buy everything. No, wait, sell everything. Buy, sell, sell, buy. Stacey Herbert. First, I'm going to start with this tweet from Bloomberg Athens. Cyprus's central bank hasn't discussed any plan to sell gold reserves. The Nicosia-based institution spokeswoman Aliki Stalianu said, Max, this was following on a headline earlier in the day, and it became big news everywhere, which was Cyprus to dive into its gold reserves. A draft bailout document seen by the Financial Times said the Cypriot authorities have committed to sell the excess amount of gold reserves owned by the Republic. The mm. excess amount was 10 tons of their 13.9 tons, which was worth 400 million euros. Right. Well, on this show, we have said that the IMF, the EU, the ECB, the so-called Troika, their, their goal as they maraud around Europe is to grab the gold. You remember Greece had to give up their gold to the Troika. Cyprus, of course, will give up their gold. And it's funny because obviously the Cypriot government was the last to know that the IMF had taken their gold. Then they said, wait a minute, no, that never happened. Then they got the phone call saying, wait, bud, we did take your gold. Then they came out and said, oh, I think they did take our gold. But of course, that's what they want. The gold price itself uh, was down on the news that there's going to be a seller in the market. Meanwhile, Chinese gold buyers are frantically on the phone. We'll take it. We'll take it. Uh, so uh, it's a great day for China. Yeah, well, gold plunged 1.65%. Then the news came out that they had denied it. And then you saw a tweet from Market Watch: gold rebounds a day after a nearly 2% tumble. And then the government of Cyprus came out and said, yes, we have a draft memo. We just haven't told our central bank yet that we're going to sell our gold. Well, as Confucius said, uh, IMF stupid sell gold, we buy. <laughs> Now, the other interesting thing about this when this news emerged is that they said the, the reason why the gold market sold off is that people, investors took this as a sign that this would be the template, the Cypriot template for the rest of Europe. Now, other Eurozone nations, and they mentioned Italy in particular, would have to give up their gold. And Italy, we know, has a lot of gold. Well, that's right. In the Eurozone, there are 12,000 tons of gold. America supposedly has 8,000 tons of gold. But as the confiscation of wealth begins in earnest and you have the breakdown in fiat currencies and the bubble in the bond market and the bubble in the stock market reaches its apex, then, as we've been saying, all roads lead back to some form of gold slash Bitcoin global currency standard. And the other thing that I've seen about when the Cyprus selling their gold, part of, this is about the bailout documents with the Troika. And they also imagine that they're going to earn 600 million euros from increasing the corporate tax rate. How are you going to increase the corporate tax rate? What corporation is going to remain in that country? This is over the next three years, they say. Right. Well, when you have people who live in the world of academia uh -huh. put out white papers suggesting that they can raise taxes on corporations in a country that's now bankrupt and somehow raise enough money to pay off the debts, that's what happens. You need actual people on the ground who are doing business, not academics who are cranking out white papers uh, who have never had a real job in their life. Ben Bernanke has never had an actual job in his life. Paul Krugman has not actually ever had an actual job in his life. They're just put out in insane documents and, and uh, if it doesn't work out, they'll, they just blame some god of insanity. Well, let's look at this. You, you know, you bring up these academics. The old ladies staff, gamers and gold bugs. The old lady, of course, is the late old lady of Threadneedle Street, and that's the Bank of England. And the Bank of England employees spend their work time playing online games, planning trips to expensive shops, and working out how to buy gold, according to data obtained by The Capitalist, a newspaper here. And what they found is, uh, of the top 500 sites, one of the m most frequented is the SBDR Gold Shares Company, a company that promises an innovative, relatively cost-efficient and secure way to access the gold markets. At the time of going to press, they say, Max, the capitalists could not confirm whether this pointed towards future monetary policy. Well, a lot of people who work in slaughterhouses become vegetarians. Uh, yeah. And people who work at the Bank of England who see what they do at the Bank of England just trashing the pound, trashing currency, making extraordinarily uh, lopsided bets in favor of uh, an entrenched aristocracy. They go out and they start buying gold. 
And you also brought up Ben Bernanke. He's in the news in the headlines this week. By accident, Fed gives early data to banks. The Federal Reserve alerted bank officials on Tuesday that policymakers were considering a shift a when to begin easing back on stimulus efforts a day before the news was released publicly. But it insisted there was no evidence traders on Wall Street had benefited from what it was called an error. And the banks were Citibank, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, UBS, BNP Paribas, and HSBC. Well, every month the Federal Reserve Bank uh, prints $85 billion in cash, mm. and uh, that money is uh, front run. In other words, uh, people are buying stocks and bonds. They know that this cash is coming. And you have these rallies in stocks and bonds based on the artificial stimulation of simply printing money. The, on top of that gaming that system, uh, they are also issuing data ahead of the official release for insider trading, as if it wasn't easy enough to make money simply front-running all the money that the, that the Fed is printing. They want to sweeten the pot by actually giving them insider information that they can trade on. And of course, in Congress, in Washington, it's not illegal to trade on inside information. It's completely legal to take inside information, call your broker, and make money on that information. It's something. It's a law carved out just for Congress that they're allowed to do that. So it, ma it makes a mockery, and I think that when I here in London, when I see people protesting and out in the streets and singing "The Wicked Witch is Dead," referring to Margaret Thatcher and the death of neoliberalism and the death of her policies that corrupted and destroyed this country, I, I see that as the opening salvo of a greater social unrest and hopefully a revolution in this country, anyway. So, but the Fed is a single point of failure, as are these uh, people who hold the, in the central data, the central information that controls the perception of our global economy. And this brings us to the final section here about uh, Bitcoin. We're actually going to talk a lot about it in the next episode because we pre-recorded an interview with Tony Gallippi of BitPay the day that the market crashed at Mt. Gox. But before that, I want to talk about the uh, the bigger picture of this, and that is. TechCrunch, unfazed by Bitcoin's wild swings and mysterious origins, Silicon Valley VCs place their bets. It's far from certain that Bitcoin is going to be a big deal, said Lightspeed Venture Partners Jeremy Liu, who has made two investments in the space. But the potential for disruption is enormous. If Bitcoin realizes its full potential, you're talking about disrupting Visa, First Data, MasterCard, a lot of banks, Western Union. These are huge, multi-billion dollar companies. It's far from certain, but if it happens, a lot of value will be destroyed and a lot of value will be created. That's when venture capitalists should be looking. Right. I mean, Bitcoin, you have to compare it to BitTorrent. BitTorrent mm. made piracy, so-called, of intellectual property like music and films a reality for millions. Totally transformed that industry to the point now where the makers of Game of Thrones have said that we welcome the pirates pirating Game of Thrones. It's our marketing strategy and we haven't stopped making money. So they finally got the religion. They got it. Tell Chris Dodd to sh STFU and stop killing kids like Aaron Swartz. Meanwhile, on Bitcoin, similarly, Visa, MasterCard, Wall Street will have their come to Bit Christ moment and they'll say, you know what, this is not a bad thing, it's a good thing, but by then the price will be well over $1,000 per Bitcoin. I personally don't like to talk about the price. I think, you know, people are obsessed with it out there. People are obsessed with not the function of a house to live in and, you know, eat and bathe in there and, and take and keep warm. They're obsessed with the prices. This is something that we see all over London. Yeah, but Visa, but MasterCard, are publicly traded companies with multi-hundred billion dollar valuations that they use to lobby Washington to change laws in their favor. Therefore, the price is important for Bitcoin to get the market cap up sufficiently so we can have our own lobbyists go to Washington and make our own laws so we can push these renegades and terrorists out of the way for a Bitcoin reality in a Bitcoin society. That's why it's important to get the price up. People who buy the price are in involved in a land rush. It's a land rush out there. You should have Bitcoin in your portfolio. So, well, let's talk about the bigger idea. Again, back to what I like is the, the notion of a payment system. As big investors emerge, Bitcoin gets ready for its close-up. Um, now, this is the Winklevoss twins have invested. Uh, they own 1% of Bitcoin, apparently. And Cameron Winklevoss says, people say it's a Ponzi scheme, it's a bubble. People really don't want to take it seriously. At some point, that narrative will shift to virtual currencies are here to stay. We're in the early days. Now, Max, you have a um, patent on virtual currencies. And this is what we're going to talk about in the next episode, because we have heard that the people who now own that patent are actually 
using that patent to create a better, more efficient market-making technology system on Bitcoin. Well, potentially, Cantor Fitzgerald, who owns my market-making technology for virtual securities with a virtual currency, are rumored now to be getting into this space. But that could be a negative because corporations and banks use patent law to thwart innovation and to kill industries. So Cantor Fitzgerald, which has already been exposed as a bad actor, uh, we don't actually want them in the space, and I hope that we'll be able to defeat them. And then finally on this, um, Chris Dixon, a partner at Anderson Horowitz, an investor in the tech space, says why he's investing in Bitcoin is that there are three eras of currency, commodity-based, example gold, politically-based, example dollar, and math-based, example Bitcoin. So he's investing as a sort of regime change currency that we go from er, you know epochs you know big time periods of gold commodity based currencies for thousands of years for the last 40 years we've been in a fiat based system and he sees this as an emergence of a math backed currency no i like that term regime change yeah. and that's exactly what it is. bitcoin yeah. is ushering in a regime change just like saddam hussein got hung so will the u.s dollar <laughs> stacy herbert thanks so much for being on the kaiser report thank you max all right, stay tuned for the second half. I'll be talking to James Turk of Gold Money Foundation. All right, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to James Turk of goldmoney.com. James, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Thanks, Max. It's always great to be with you. So much is happening, James. I, a lot to cover. I wanted to just jump right in. I read a headline. I thought immediately of you. Portugal will begin paying their public workers with treasury bills instead of cash. Oh, this sounds like an alarm bell. Your thoughts? Yeah, it definitely is an alarm bell. You know, there's a saying uh, from an American philosopher, if you ignore history, you end up reliving it. And what Portugal is doing is what happened in America after the War of Independence. Um, instead of actually paying bills, they issued little pieces of paper, uh, and those little pieces of paper circulated as currency. They're called bills of credit. Because the result was so bad, the, the currency at the time, the continental, which was the first currency in America, hyperinflated, they put it in the Constitution that you can't issue bills of credit. Portugal is trying to issue bills of credit. They call it you know, treasury bills, but it's essentially the same thing. Okay, let's, let's jump over to Cyprus. Okay, Cyprus, they're, they're taking money out of people's bank accounts. We saw it at the MF Global in the United States, although more on the institutional side. It kind of went over the people's heads. They weren't paying much attention to it. Now the government's just taking money out of people's bank accounts. Your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it was a shocker for me in the sense that they were first talking about going even after the insured deposits, and then they backtracked from that very, very quickly. But I think there are a couple lessons that you know we can we can take from it. Uh, I think the first is that they just don't have the money to do a bailout. Uh, you know, I think the, the central bankers and the central planners of this world realize that the problems are just too big, that they can't just create uh, more bailouts because the money isn't there. And I think the second thing we can take away from it is that there's a black hole on the balance sheet of, of the banks, of the banking system. You know, the liabilities are much greater than the amount of assets, and they have to fill that black hole. And they've been doing that with with bailouts. Um, but the, I think the point of Cyprus is that there are a lot of other banks around the world that have this black hole on their balance sheet. And you know, I've always been calling Cyprus not a euro crisis, it's a banking crisis. And I think this banking crisis is going to spread to other countries. Right. It's not a liquidity crisis, it's an insolvency crisis. Exactly. And banks look like they're solvent because they're liquid until overnight the liquidity dries up for whatever reasons. In the case of Cyprus, the ECB said they're not going to lend them more money. Uh, and the insolvency became quite clear. Um, so, you know, that's the nature of bank failures. They look good until they actually fail, which is an overnight event. Well, you look in the whole Eurozone, up until recently, there's been this idea that they could create these master funding um, platforms to roll the debt forward, extend and pretend. They came up with the various acronyms for various funds. And of course, all these funds were backstopped by the ECB, which is essentially the old Deutsche Bank, the old Bank of Germany, essentially. But in the Cyprus situation, like Germany finally came out and said, you know, no, we don't, we don't we're not going to, they're, they're drawing the line there. So it, it seems like the Euro project, which was supposedly bringing harmony, and they won the recent peace prize for the, all the harmony of the Euro project, suddenly there's acrimony, and Germany seems to be playing a tr very traditional role here of, of squaring off against everybody else. Is Germany, uh, have they essentially closed the credit spigots and they're just going to let these companies waste away? Well, you know, it's a good point. Maybe this was set up to enable 
Germany to have an excuse to withdraw from the euro and create a northern euro with itself, Holland, maybe Slovakia, Finland, and one or two other countries. Uh, that's a possibility. But I think you know what they're trying to do, or what they tried to do with quantitative easing and all this money printing, is hope that by putting this money into the economy, that the economy would get jump-started and the problems would disappear. But I think they're recognizing now that all of the money printing in the world has not solved the unemployment problem, got the economy moving, and those problems are getting bigger and bigger as the economy continues to deteriorate. And so I think they're really now in, in, in crunch time, and they're starting to recognize the reality of the situation and that these remedies that they've been trying haven't worked. All right, now, I know you're friends with uh, another frequent guest on our show, James Rickards. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, he uh, talks about the currency collapses around the world kind of going in a certain order based on vulnerabilities. And I think clearly Japan is in a precarious situation. So if you could just talk a little bit about what's happening in Japan and the yen and the policies. And then is he correct and do you agree that the next currency could be the British pound? But first the yen. Yeah. It, you know, What's happening in, in Japan is just unbelievable. You know, on a per capita basis, they've been doing quite well compared to Europe and, and even to the, the United States. Um, you know, they say that deflation is bad, but deflation really isn't bad because it basically means that your purchasing power, the money, is worth more uh, in the future than it is today. So you're actually increasing your purchasing power in a deflationary environment. The, the new prime minister wants to change that, and the central bank governors following that policy, and it literally opened up the printing presses. And the yen, which was 77 last year to the dollar, is now approaching 100 to the dollar. It shows you how badly the yen is weakened. And everybody is expecting a huge inflationary um, result and perhaps a hyperinflationary result. Um, you know, what we are seeing worldwide is a horse race between the currencies, you know, the yen, the euro, the dollar, and the British pound. And it's a question of which one collapses first. And uh, right now, the yen is leading. Mm -hmm. And it could well be that the pound might be next. But I'll tell you, it's a, it's a close horse race as to which one it will be. You mentioned deflation. Uh, and of course, that brings me into the new kid on the block, Bitcoin, mm. which uh, one of the criticisms you hear in some portions of the press is that it's bad because it's, there's a fixed rate. There's only going to be 21 million. Therefore, that's going to be deflationary at some point, And that's bad. But if uh, you're an adherent to, let's say, the Austrian school of economics, where you're talking about gold as a currency or gold as money, it naturally has a somewhat fixed rate of supply as well. So I would imagine that Bitcoin, from an Austrian perspective, uh, we're going to get a bit philosophical here, it, it seems to play into the Austrian mindset. However, within the Austrian school, there are people who are expressed uh, very negative uh, thoughts on Bitcoin. James Turk, the, the man, <laughs> tell us your opinion. You're going to put me into a big controversy. <laughs> yeah, you're going to put in the middle of this. <laughs> sort it out. Well, you know, the Austrians have a problem, some Austrian school um, people have a problem with it because it doesn't tie neatly into the regression theorem, which okay, is... Okay, which is? Which is basically that money has to have some tangible substance, some other use besides its use as a, a means of account. And it kind of goes back to barter. Exactly. If you, the, if you, you take it back to the Carl beginning and, and, and how money eventually evolved and gold and silver became the most liquid form of commodity and therefore they had a monetary role. Right. Aside so you're addressing from their through jewelry. the history and you're saying, well, it was barter and then they had a substitute for barter, but it has a value and that value is worth the value of the barter. and that's the, But, but you, they don't like it because it doesn't express that. Yeah. But in my mind, what's mo the most important contribution of the Austrian school is that value is subjective. Every individual sees a particular object. Um, or even an intangible object and can view it differently than another person. And I think that's really what the underlying value argument is for Bitcoin, that because value is subjective and everybody sees it differently, some people might value Bitcoin more highly than other people. And you know, Bitcoin does have advantages and disadvantages. It's like everything else in this world. Nothing is perfect. But it does have some unique advantages in the sense that it cannot be confiscated Firstly, you know, in the 20th century, you know, gold was confiscated by Lenin, Mussolini, Hitler, and Roosevelt. You know, why did they do that? They tried to increase the power of the state by getting control of the money in the printing press. Bitcoin prevents that. So in that sense, Bitcoin is, is an important consideration, and I think it is a step forward in terms of monetary development, and we have to look at it seriously. We've actually been studying it now for a few months to see. Uh, you know, where'd you get the idea to study it? <laughs> Thanks, oh, Max. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't get any credit for this stuff, and I'm <laughs> rectifying that right now. So anyway, but 
Using this mining metaphor as, as it relates to gold, people understand there's a limited amount of gold. You've got to go mine it. And as you mine it, it gets more expensive. You know, in South Africa, they're so far deep down in the mines that they're almost touching lava. It's very hot down there. They're yeah. running out of gold. We've hit peak gold. Yeah. Right? But some of those mines have to be air conditioned because they're so hot, because they're so deep. And it's expensive. Yeah. Obviously, the costs go up. Whoever created Bitcoin, and nobody really knows who this chap is or whether it's actually a group of individuals, they obviously understood gold and they understood, you know, mining and all of the. But they mentioned gold mining in the, some of the documents that yes. we do have available from the creators. Yes. They mentioned gold mining. They mentioned that they're completely unhappy with the current way banks are run. But the way that this algorithm works is you're digging into essentially a mine, if you will, of primary numbers Correct. that get increasingly more difficult to extract with the distributed network of computers. So that in itself, in a world that we live in digital and in a world of cryptology and in a world of surveillance, mm -hmm. can't you say that there's a scarcity value that, that it has intrinsic value unto itself, above and beyond the utility value that you just described? Well, I'm not a mathematician, but then again, I'm not a miner either. <laughs> but you know, I understand that gold has value and I see that you know, uh, Bitcoin has value to people who understand mathematics. So instead of mining into geology, you're mining into mathematics. And I think, you know, the logic of it um, makes sense. Uh, and also, you know, given the fact that there are advantages to Bitcoin, like it cannot be confiscated, it's a very um, good online currency in, in many, many respects. I think it does have some unique advantages that, that need further, con uh, further study. All right, speaking of Austrians, I saw on the Lou Rockwell site, who is a noted uh, libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, and Austrian school fellow. Uh, he had a, a piece up on his site, and I actually liked the piece because he, uh, the writer was saying that people should be prepared for an attack on Bitcoin because it challenges the state, it challenges the banks. The banks can't continue their rent-seeking ways in their fiat currency ways, their fractional banking ways. Mm -hmm. And he, the writer is saying, prepare yourself for this attack. But the, my question is, uh, do you think that the, in fact, Bitcoin represents a threat to these guys? You you rub elbows with these guys, James Turk. Are they? What are they? What do they tell us? What are they saying? Are they run, Are they getting a little concerned? Perhaps, but what can you do about it? You know, it's been put out there, and it. You say it with an evil laugh. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> no, not evil at all. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 like I say, it's you know, Bitcoin has advantages, and it is a reality. Um, mm. And you know, maybe they're going to fight it as it gets bigger and as it becomes more popular. I hope they don't, because I'm in favor of you know, let individuals choose what currencies they want to use. I'm, you know, this is Ron Paul's point. You know, the uh, freedom of choice in terms of currencies, which goes back to you know, uh, Friedrich Hayek and, right. and his denationalization of money. Let national money compete against free market money and see whatever people want to use and let them free, be free to choose. You know, after all, that's how we humans progress. Uh, you know, when we interact with one another, we, you know, Adam Smith's invisible hand, we both end up benefiting from it. So, you know, let's go back to, you know, basic uh, classic economic principles and, and let every currency compete against one another. Well, competition breeds growth versus central planning, which kind of breed, you know, more stagnation. Yeah. And I think that's a fair statement. I've always said that. I mean, I can debate people on that point. But I want to get back to this idea. We have about a minute or so left. The big trend of the day is this confiscation. Now, in Cyprus, they've just taken the money out of the bank accounts. With MF Global, Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan, they did it on the institutional level. They essentially stole a billion dollars. Jamie Dimon just said, look, I'm a gangster. You can't do anything about it. Now, uh, there is another form of confiscation, though, which we see in the US and in the UK. It's called quantitative easing. Right? Am I wrong to say that? Talk yeah, about there, it. You're, no, you, you are. It is confiscation because you're taking wealth, you're taking purchasing power away from individuals who hold those currencies. You know, if you put a hundred pounds or a hundred dollars in a bank account on January one, at the end of the year you might have a hundred and one dollars or a hundred one pounds, but your purchasing power is only like ninety five or maybe even a little bit less. Yeah, well, let me let me come in first because in the UK, the interest rates are forced out through quantitative easing. Right. As a result, the interest on things like mortgages are less, so people end up paying. 70 billion pounds less in interest income last year. However, people with money in the bank who would get interest on that, on that, uh, on that money in savings lost 220 billion yes, you're pounds. Just, you're destroying capital. With you're destroying loads. capital. You're, you're shifting money from people who worked hard and saved to speculators. Exactly. But, but, and the government's enabling that. You're shifting it to debtors. Now, debt is not necessarily bad, but the point is, is that debt has to be serviced by hard-earned capital. I mean, you can't destroy the, the depositors because if you do that, you're destroying capitalism and that just completely wrecks our economy. All right, well, we're out of time, but I do want to mention before we go that uh, you also have um, 
Gold Money News as a channel on YouTube. And there's a lot of excellent interviews on there now. I haven't, I just checked in with it again after six months and you've got lots of great stuff. You've got a team down in Cyprus. They've got man on the street interviews down there and it's really built up a, quite a resource. So yeah. I would direct people to that. Is it going well? The, yeah, it is going well. That Cyprus interview is very popular. It really shows what's happening, you know, how the bankers pounded Cyprus back to the stone age, literally. Um, but there's also one that, you know, you and I did a year or so ago called Fiat Money Inflation in France. And I highly recommend, you know, tuning into that one as That's well. That's right, because the assignat was the same thing as monetizing debt and yeah. the revolution quickly came after that. Exactly. There's a lot of information from that uh, that video that applies to today. So I recommend taking a look at that one. It's too. a classic video. Yeah, it's it is. It's a classic <laughs> video. All right, James Turk, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Thank Report. Thank you, Max. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, James Turk of goldmoney.com. If you'd like to send us an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.